I would like to introduce Dr. Mary Bove. She is a naturopathic physician and the director of medical education for Gaia Herbs. We're going to be talking about autism and nature enriching our children's lives. Welcome. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for having me. So first, before we get started, what is your passion and and why did you get involved um, in wanting to even talk about autism? Ah, that's a wonderful question. Well, uh, for 25 years, I practiced uh, family naturopathic medicine. I did home birthing and wellness care through pregnancy. And in that time, I uh, wrote a book on uh, natural health care for children. And of course, over the last 25 years, autism has, uh, you know, come more and more uh, to the forefront. And as a young woman, I got a, a BA in psychology, and it was in a very small college in Vermont. And at that time, in 1976, I think it was, I worked with one of two autistic children in Vermont at that time. And uh, this particular child was autistic based on uh, having pretty much lived in a closet most of uh, her life. And so it always kind of stuck in my mind, and as autism became more and more prevalent as modern-day living, and um, I studied health, and I studied, uh, you know, uh, health within the prenatal atmosphere, as well as, you know, children and infancy, as well as um, young children, and one thing just kind of led to the other, and then at that same time, I would say that I interwove a passion for me, which was plants and medicinal plants, particularly, which is something that I've been pursuing since I was about 18 years old. And what do you think are the possible connections to autism? Well, I think there are, you know, multiple aspects to those connections in that sense that, um, you know, it's not just one thing. And one thing that I ask myself is, is that, you know, what's happened? How has things change. Why in the 70s was it, you know, less than 1% of our child population and why now do we see it in some states, you know, up to 50%, uh, you know, of uh, <clears throat> some children in those areas. So uh, for me, I think that looking at the prenatal environment, looking at our environment that we live in as far as environmental factors and toxicity, uh, prevalence with what we would call endocrine disruptors, uh, which have to do with different types of toxins. Again, you know, how we develop, how we develop, you know, even before a woman gets pregnant and what's happening in that period of time and in early pregnancy and the pregnancy itself and in early childhood exposure, what happens, uh, you know, there. And, and, and one good example would be something like as simple as stress. Stress in the prenatal time changes the environment that the baby is then uh, exposed to because there's a lot of stress hormones happening, which then impacts the physiology of the woman. And we know that that can alter and impair brain circulation and even size uh, of brain and development of things like memory, cognitive function alone. So, you know... To me, something as simple as, you know, um, stress, could, which could be nutritional stress or it could be emotional stress or it could be traumatic, you know, psychological stress, they all seem to you know, aspects which change the physiology and impact how a child develops or how our tissue develops or how, uh, you know, a system uh, develops. So what do you think the possible environmental factors that are connected to autism? Well, I think there are many. Um, You know, if we look at that aspect in in that sense that um, one topic, some people look at nutritional aspects, some people look at toxic aspects in the sense of whether that's keys or whether it's environmental uh, toxins that lead towards disruption in you know, hormonal, whether it has to do with how we, uh, you know, grow our food um, or how things as simple as medications or even vaccines. And I think that all of those things are, you know, looked at as, as 
as, uh, you know, possible contributions uh, in that, and even viral aspects or something as simple as um, exposure to, as I said, stress hormones or testosterone uh, in the environmental, uh, prenatal environment. But, you know, when we look at things like um, our modern environment and toxic exposure through, uh, you know, and um, what should I say, possibilities for nutritional deficiencies, I think that, you know, we begin to see that it's multifactorial, that it's not just one thing, that it's multiple things. And in that study that was done where they took the 10 American babies done, uh, on different maternity wards born across the United States and looked at their blood and looked at what average chemicals were there um, from living in our environment, you know, at birth, we, you know, we are exposed to those aspects and we're exposed to those aspects from the get-go, from the beginning of when our cells start to divide. And so, you know, influences in how our development, how our tissues and our, and our brain and, and all of the systems develop uh, are greatly influenced by that. And so what do you think, if any, hormonal factors that are connected to autism? Well, I think, you know, as I made that uh, example, stress hormones are certainly part of that aspect, as well as um, there are some research uh, that also points to the fact that if there's increased exposure to testosterone during the prenatal time, that also can uh, affect the, the way the um, brain and the environment develops. And I think... Some of it, as I said earlier, has to do with what we would call hormonal disruptors. And those things that change and disrupt our, um, our endocrine system and the way that it's able to work and the way that it's able to develop. And I think that's a big piece because children are developing not only in prenatal time, but, you know, for the first 12 to 18 to 24 months, there are multiple things in their body that continue to to uh, develop. And I think there, um, if we have things that are interrupting our hormonal development, be that thyroid hormone, be that adrenal hormone, be that, you know, a gender hormone, uh, that all of those things can then, you know, contribute to the function of the body and, and particularly like with neurotransmitters and brain hormones. And so do you think there is a relationship between gut health and autism? Yes, I absolutely do. And I think one thing that, you know, over the last couple of years with the um, microbiome project that we have um, been able to see the connection uh, with probiotics and uh, with the microbiome and how that um, has connected into development of the neurological system, development of the immune system, the ability for the neurological system to be able to uh, have healthy communication as well as ability for the, uh, the immune system. And so I think one of the things that we see in the microbiome uh, issues is that there many, many children with autistic challenges have digestive challenges. And I think it's going back to what we talked about earlier. What can we do um, to improve today what's happening for an autistic child? And gut health is directly related to being able to help, not only in being able to uh, improve nutritional aspects, but also to improve how we make fuel and energy and how that's then going to be delivered to the brain as well as the, the cells of the muscles and the rest of the body also how our the immune system and how we actually develop uh, types of immune antibodies. And these things are, are also things that we find compromised in these type of children. So I think here, when somebody says, what can we do to aspect to look at that is through clinical practice, time and time again, I found that those children had compromise in their digestive enzymes uh, to break down and get nutrients from the foods they ate, or they had a high amount of food allergies or food sensitivities that contributed to a chronic inflammatory issue in their gut, which then compromised their gut ability. Um, or they had 
digestive issues as far as bowel issues or um, um, stomach pain or, or a- different aspects that would then create some compromise. So I find that uh, working with a child who ha- is, com- is challenged with uh, autism will at a gut level and improving their gut mucosa, their digestive capacity, and their microbiome. Um, particularly their, you know, general overall health, their microbiome, as that's going to influence other systems, you know, systems as unhealth of like membranes in their respiratory system. It's going to influence their skin and skin health, and it will also uh, influence overall detoxification, which is another aspect that I think is sometimes compromised in these children. And now you keep using the word microbiome. I know a lot of people listening might not even know what that means. Can you uh, elaborate more on that? Yes. The um, microbiome is a term that um, has kind of transgressed over the last few years uh, to talk or to mean that those microbes that make up uh, uh, our living kind of micro world of the human being. And so that means we have them in our gut. We have them on our skin. We, they play a part in how we work. And when I first went to medical school, they, you know, um, proposed that maybe we had a couple hundred microbes that lived within our human, you know, body. And now we know that that's spouse and that they change. Um, we have microbes that um, play different functions in the way that we develop, in our immune system, um, in our skin health, in our digestive health, in our immunity and defense overall. And so the Human Microbiome Project that the uh, National Health Institute did really helped to open up our understanding of how important the balance of our microbiome and the health of our microbiome contributes to our health overall. So sterilizing our kids and sterilizing the kids' bottles and their toys and everything they did wasn't necessarily a a great idea because a sterile microbiome isn't one um, of health and strength. And we know that more versatile, so a child who's more exposed to um, and has a variety of microbes that make up the microbiome typically has, uh, you know, a stronger overall uh, vibrant health in that sense. Now, when you're talking about, you know, the microbiome, how does it, you know, you, you elaborated somewhat on how, you know, it helps, um, you know, with the gut and everything else, but what about the overall health? Um, and is it something that all of us, not just those on the spectrum, need to be concerned about? Yes. Yes, it is. It's something I think that's an ongoing uh, health concern. It's like, it's a living thing, just as we are. And so it's a part of, um, you know, being mindful of, of the fact that it's, our, it's kind of our garden. And so it's, it's ongoing growing. And it does. It, it, uh, a healthy microbiome, you know, often means a healthier mood. There's been able to, there's connections that show that healthy microbiome, you know, can contribute to a much healthier brain function as far as mood and sense of well-being, healthy microbiome also has shown to have much healthier um, ability for better oxidation, you know, antioxidant effects and uh, anti-inflammatory effects. So we regulate our inflammation better. They also find that the microbiome is, uh, you know, connected into uh, overall immune and our sense that our immune um, system and all the aspects of it are linked very much to the way our microbiome health and vitality uh, work within the gut. And we know that they play specialized uh, jobs in that sense that, that, um, for instance, when a child is teething, um, during a teething time, the body actually cultivates a microbe that is, is there only during teething time as it assists with making sure that the gums and the mouth are healthy while teething is occurring because teething is a bit of a compromise in the sense that it's hot and inflamed and you're cutting through the tissues. And so the body actually cultivates a microbe 
that actually helps to nurse that and to police that and make sure that everything goes right and you're not at risk for getting infection. And it's not there at any other time in a human being's, you know, lifespan. So it's actually very specific to each individual human being, you know, and different times um, of our growth and development. So for good memory, there's connection. Microbiome is connected with obesity and ability to, you know, um, burn fat efficiently because of what kinds of microbes we have there. And a child in their first few years of life are really still developing their gut and their whole gut ability to um, digest and they cultivate. So microbiome actually takes about, you know, two years to even get fully, you know, started in its full maturation. And so it has a lot to do with, you know, with our nutrition, with our immune health, with early growth and development, and also even with our ability to, you know, be sensitive to foods or not sensitive to foods. Now, what about probiotics? We've all heard about probiotics. Um, you know, first of all, what are probiotics and, and why are they crucial? Yes, well, probiotics are basically a supplement form of what we would call types of microbes that tend to be most prevalent in the human gut. And they're things like lactobacillus species and bifidobacterium species and uh, and a variety of types of bacteria and yeast um, tend to grow there in different ratios. Um, And and probiotics is a, a way in which you can inoculate the gut. So we can't necessarily give every individual um, microbe that might live in a human's gut, but we can, we can influence it uh, by doing some predominant strains. And we found that certain strains have particular novelties about them and specialities in the sense that those strains might actually be um, helpful in reducing, well, would say, you know, enteritis or inflammation in the in the stomach or uh, acute traveler's diarrhea, um, things like that. So probiotics can be used to build the microbiome if the microbiome is compromised. It al- they also can be used for specific therapeutic uh, needs. And we can get probiotics from eating um, fermented cultured foods, so yogurt, and pickles and kimchi uh, are all examples of types of foods that carry these types of bacteria that our gut can. And we're, we're meant to constantly re-inoculate our body through our diet, um, even through possibly having a little bit of dirt in the eye of a carrot when you eat it out of your garden because soil carries some of those types of microbes that our body can use. And some are just used and some are actually colonated. And many people who have inflammatory issues in their gut or compromising their bowel function or compromising their digestion find that probiotics are very helpful in getting their gastrointestinal abnormalities back, you know, uh, you know in more a uh, healthy effect. And they also, you know, uh, often work well when combined with dietary regulations or uh, restrictions, herbal medicines, and what we call prebiotics. And prebiotic foods are foods that feed the probiotics, such as having something like oatmeal, uh, which is a prebiotic food, um, uh, as cinnamon is a prebiotic food, uh, that helps to uh, allow probiotics to, um, you know, have something to um, energize them to feed on and to cultivate them. Now, we've heard, or some people might have heard, of something called an adaptogen. What, what are adaptogens? Ah, we're moving to herbal medicine. Adaptogens is a term that's used in herbal medicine. And it's a term that um, is used to, what we would say, describe a... Uh, plant or a herb that uh, had a particular focus in the sense or a particular effect. In the sense, an adaptogen is something that helps the body to adapt, and it's also stress protective. And in helping the body to adapt, what that means 
it helps it to be able to adapt to their changes in its environment, whether that's a stressful change or whether it's, you know, cold to hot um, or whether it's actually an illness. And botanical adaptogen agents really help to focus on what we call the autonomic nervous system. So they help to improve our ability for the autonomic nervous system to function, which is where we normally would functioning on our day-to-day. And as I said, they're stress protectors, and they help to focus in on the stress system, which is involved the adrenal gland and the nervous system. And I believe that in this time of modern day life, you know, and hectic life and challenges with toxic exposure and digital exposure and all the challenges we have in the 2016. I feel that adaptogens offer the human body kind of a little shield, you know, a way to be able to not be dragged down by all of that dynamic, to be able to um, kind of, what should I say, rebalance themselves by using, you know, plants like adaptogens. The other thing about adaptogens is that they're generally non-toxic and they help the the body to refocus itself, rebalance itself. So if someone is in a hyper state, it will help them to calm. If they're in a hypo or a low state, it can be energizing. Um, And so it can help to bring that balance back to, uh, you know, a tissue or an organ or a system. Now, what role do they play in overall health and, and how do they support children with autism? Yeah, well, I think, you know, in overall health, because they really focus in on our endocrine function, our adrenal function, our thyroid function, our glycemic function, that, that's part of kind of the nuts and bolts uh, uh, communication of the runnings of the day-to-day. And so adaptogens help very much there, and they help us to adapt on a, a, a regular basis. For an autistic child, we have to remember that the world isn't always a friendly place. And they're, you know, in a different different um, perspective of what that means. and But they're still in a very physical body that's taking the repercussions of what it feels like to always be in sympathetic or in a fright-flight place so that their bodies you know, under the siege of stress and that tends to eke away or wear away at the physiology. And adaptogens help to um, protect against that, help to to, you know, allow the body not to have that effect get un- in the working. At the same time, many, many adaptogens affect the nervous system and they affect the way our nervous system functions. That means how it can communicate, how the neurotransmitters um, work within our body and our moods. And, you know, and for an autistic child, having plants, help to put them back in a parasympathetic, an autonomic place where that means that there's, there's an ability to relax tissue, calm a state. Um, it can be very useful in helping to improve sleep or to improve um, or even to shield, you know, during different types of situations, whether that's transitional situations, you know, um, or, you know, change in space or, or, you know, um, texture or clothing, all of the kinds of things that um, can, you know, serve as a challenge for an autistic child. Now, let's move on to herbs. You've mentioned a little bit about um, herbs. Um, Can you give us some examples of some herbs that you feel we should be looking into? Yes. I think when we, you know, talk about herbs, we can talk about groups of herbs like adaptogens. We can also talk about, uh, you know, other groups of herbs that are, uh, are um, useful, like herbs that help to impact um, gastrointestinal function or microbiota support. So a child who's autistic and challenged with their gut, um, herbal medicine can offer things such as marshmallow root and astragalus root. Uh, which help to support microbiota growth and taken with probiotics can make a big difference in the the gut function. 
using herbal nervines and relaxant agents can help very much, you know, for useful, whether it's at a tissue and to relax muscle or to relax, you know, the mind per se or to help with sleep or cognition, um, all of those things. They also help with as cerebral vascular agents to improve circulation and oxygen uptake in the brain function. Uh, we can see, you know, her, you know, playing those roles. So that's just, a, you know, a, a few uh, um, overall categories. If we look at specific herbs, a herb like um, withania or ashwagandha, which is a herb that's very effective as an adaptogen, also is a, a plant that helps with uh, attention and hyperactivity. It also helps with um, improving memory and mood. And so there are aspects where that plant, it's also been very useful in infants who are slow to gain weight and slow to um, grow in development and helping with improving development um, and memory and uh, alertness and performance. So uh, again, you know, that would be an example of an adaptogen plant, a plant that we might all know or, you know, think of as uh, a plant called lemon balm. And lemon balm is a plant that can be used um, for helping with attention and cognition, for anxiety, uh, for focus, for helping for sleep, as well as helping for uh, uh, agitation in the gut. And that's a, a, you know, a very useful plant because it can be given in um, oral forms of, of different preparations, be that a tea, or a tincture. It can also be given uh, as a uh, aromatic therapy, so gone through um, aromatherapy, so it goes through the olfactory uh, nerves and the nose and right into the limbic system of the brain, which helps with, again, a sense of calmness and an uplifting sense in mood, and it uh, uh, helps with, uh, you know, attention and focus as well. Um, and that is, you know, is more is done through uh, diffusion, through smelling, and not through taking it orally. And sometimes some children can't comply with oral use of herbal medicine, so using aromatherapy of herbal medicine can make a big difference there. Now, what role does the nervous system play in autism? Well, I think, you know, here there are many aspects. When we look at herbal medicine, what we really want to focus in here is um, um, her with herbal medicines that either work as nervines, as I've spoken about, or relaxants that work on tissue states, so helping to change the, the, the tissue state of um, muscles and um, uh, like the gut tension, as well as what we would call uh, herbs that help to build or nourish the nervous system. And those would be like things like um, American Skullcap or Wild Oat or Go to Cola. And these plants have traditionally been used to build uh, a deficient nervous system. And so uh, we, again, we want to build up the part of the nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and particularly parasympathetic, and help the child to move out of sympathetic uh, nervous function, which is that fright-flight aspect, which keeps the the uh, whole body in a state of um, um, sympathetic overload, which, you know, tends to then trickle down. So herbs, you know, play a big part here uh, in offering uh, the ability to nourish the nervous system. Also, we can look at using herbs symptomatically in the sense whether we need a calming bath, whether there's, you know, um, discomfort or pain per se, some children who have autism and constipation find that the use of something like valerian, lemon balm, or chamomile flowers can all be useful in helping to diminish the pain in the gut that can come from constipation. So we can even find, you know, uses for them in, in simple places where a child, you know, particularly an autistic child who has issues with um, body sensation may find that herbs offer some symptomatic or, you know, some relief there. 
I think also when we look at, um, you were talking about adaptogens, but when we look at plants traditionally, like um, some of the traditional plants from Ayurveda, many of those plants that are adaptogens also help to modulate brain stress hormones and restore the nervous system, as I talked about. A herb known as bicopa is very useful in, as a restoration herb for central nervous system function and for uh, as an adaptogen. And so I think, you know, recognizing that um, we do have plants and that the plants, you know, don't all have current science, but many of them also have traditional use uh, in areas in which relay when we look at autism um, in that sense, in the sense that if we're challenged at our endocrine system, if we're challenged in our nervous system, if we're challenged in our gut, in our detox system, to be able to look at plants to help with, um, uh, you know, these systems and helping them to function more optimally, then that helps the quality of that day-to-day for that child. And what role does cortisol play in autism? And, you know, why is it an important aspect for us to consider? Well, as you know, cortisol is a stress hormone. And, you know, as we've been talking about stress, I think we recognize um, that stress trickles down in many aspects um, to, uh, you know, how it affects our physiology. And we do know that stress, as I said, in the prenatal time can lead to compromise in brain activity and compromise in brain size and growth, circuit formation. We also know that cortisol, you know, levels when they're high in children, you know, particularly young children, tend to create issues with physical development and motor skill development, mental development. They compromise new memory formation and really compromise attention and the ability to maintain attention uh, and self-regulation. So cortisol, you know, um, being a hormone of stress and being a modern uh, hormone that disrupts how our endocrine system talks to our uh, nervous system, it it, uh, interplays with sleep and memory, attention span, self-regulation. These things all um, influence the health of a child. Plus, cortisol also influences immune function, and high levels of cortisol will decrease immune function. It challenges our glucose metabolism, creating more insulin resistance or um, issues with not being able to get good cellular energy, and compromises, you know, um, blood pressure and cardiovascular effect as well. So there's a cortisol is far reaching in that effect, and that's why I feel that adopt makes such a, 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 uh, a good herbal option because they hel- it helps to modulate and mediate cortisol levels. Sure. Can we monitor, like, these cortisol levels, and can plants help with cortisol? Uh-huh. Yes, there are ways to monitor cortisol levels. There are um, saliva tests that can be done. They're called functional tests, uh, which will measure the cortisol level at uh, any given time or over a period of 24 hours. You may do four or six um, samples, and that would look at the rhythm, the 24-hour circadian rhythm of cortisol, which can very much help to look at how to um, address your botanical therapy. And, yes, the plants that help, would be adaptogens. And what we're finding is that adaptogens can impact what we call the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access, the the way our brain and our endocrine system talk and speak and interact. And these plants help with that aspect as well as help with modulating cortisol. And so um, in doing that, you know, if cortisol is, you know, excessively high during the night, and disrupt it to a night cycle and sleep, then yes, you can use plants to help to modulate that to keep the cortisol from being high at night and then to allow a a normal night cycle. Now, what about detox? Um, 
Why is detox important when we're looking at overall health and wellness? Okay, well, detox, um, and I think we've talked about the fact that in detoxification, we look at a variety of aspects, but when we look at environmental uh, contributions or toxins, we then recognize that detoxification has to occur. And one of the things that I know from, you know, um, working with autistic children over the years uh, and looking at different types of functional tests on detoxification was that, yes, there's compromise there, that we don't see good detoxification um, aspects. And so we need, you know, cellular detoxification. We need lymph, bowel, uh, liver support in that detoxification, particularly if there's heavy metals, um, if there's, uh, you know, amalgam issues or uh, vaccine connections or, or toxic connections with other types of solvents uh, that can contribute. And many of these types of things tend to deposit in the nervous system, and then they tend to disrupt or inhibit um, or negate nervous health and nervous function. So detoxification often is a, you know, part of an overall plan used in uh, working with autistic children. It's not necessarily an ongoing therapy, but it's a part of a therapy. Now, you brought up environment and things like that. What about nature? Can uh, nature help children with autism? Oh, absolutely, and I think that's a, such a great question. I think we're just beginning to see that nature is a huge stress reducer for children. That, um, and when we talk about nature, we should talk about green space. That we, there is um, research that shows that green space helps diminish stress and strain and anxiety, um, also helps to improve uh, cognition and attention. We also talk about nature. We can talk about animal therapy, and there's wonderful information out there on animal therapy, on on animals helping to um, interact with uh, these children in ways that are nonverbal and and, and really can reach them in some very, very um, heart-touching ways. We have light therapy, getting out in the sunshine. There's, you know... um, some great research that show, shows children who, who go outside and exercise gain so much more from that than children who do the same exercise in a gymnasium under artificial lighting. So we want to do that outside physical activities for, for that. And even just mindfulness meditation and being out in nature is one of those places in which we, we see that. We see that there is, you know, better retention and comprehension uh, that can occur. I think that um, one of the things that we, we recognize is that there's something called, you know, that happens when we're in green space, that um, green space is a time, you know, being out in green space helps us actually restore our attention. So attention restoration therapy is a way where we use green space to restore our um, voluntary attention. And so when we're out in the classroom, we have to, it requires us to be voluntarily attention, you know, and so we have to pay attention. We're in in a green space. We're not. We're in an involuntary place. We're functioning in a mindful moment. And that is very restoring to other parts of our our brain and our attention. So it's a, a, you know, another way or aspect in which a child might be able to help to cultivate um, their um, mind ability. So creating a healthy living space, I think, makes it, it, you know, very important for the autistic child. I think, you know, decorating with nature, having windows, using aromatherapy, full-spectrum lighting, color, access to animals or animal friends, that these things are ways in which we can reach children uh, in... in, um, you know, without necessarily putting a medicine down their mouth. You mentioned a little bit about animal therapy and, and even, you know, going back a, a moment to the nature part. I know my son, 
he just thrives being outside. Um, we live near a beach, and that's one of his favorite things to do is either go to the beach or go on a nature walk. And it seems as though it, it provides a lot of calmness to him, and he seems to have clearer focus. And it really helps him throughout his whole day, even if it was just an hour we got to do that. And then regarding animal therapy, you brought that up a little bit. Um, are you meaning things like hippotherapy where they're riding the horse? Um, I know my son just recently started hippotherapy not that long ago, and it seems to be doing very well. He's very afraid of animals, and so we thought if we could maybe introduce him to an animal that was used to being around, you know, special needs children, that maybe it could start creating a, a, a bond between the two. And he still struggles a bit, but my goodness, he's so excited to go see his horse every week named Josie. And, and it seems to calm him down after about 10 minutes of his hippotherapy. So when you're talking about animal therapy, is that what you're referring to or just something totally different? No, I'm referring to that as a form of animal therapy, and I and I know that that um, you know horses have always been one uh, of the foremost places where we start to use that. I think you also see it with dogs. I think um, um, they, there are dog reading programs for children who can't read, who won't read, um, or uh, have uh, reading challenges, and put in uh, a room with a dog as a reading companion. They find that that they make leaps and bounds. And so I think there are multiple aspects. In my own personal um, experience in my clinic, uh, I had multiple occasions where I watched children who, um, one particular little girl who hadn't um, spoken for four years and she was now about seven years old, eight years old, and she met a cat that used to come, my cat that, Lucy just believed that she belonged in the clinic as part of the staff. Mm -hmm. And that morning when she met Lucy and heard Lucy's name uh, and start and heard me do my little sing-songy uh, greeting to Lucy that morning, she actually started humming. And then as I um, started speaking the words more in a song, she actually started singing to the cat, and the grandmother and the mother mm -hmm. were in the clinic, and, and you know, at that time, sitting there, and they were flabbergasted, and they left the clinic and actually got went and got cats, and the cats in this little girl's life started to actually help draw her out and make her feel safe in the world. That's so beautiful. That makes me so excited to hear about you know because I feel like you know. Our children, especially our special needs children, and so sometimes it just takes that little bit of magic and whatever that is, if it be a cat or a dog or a horse or who knows, that just kind of unlocks them and, and helps them have that combination to the world in a totally different way. So I think that's so beautiful that it happened to be your cat. <laughs> yes, and I think it's, you know, just as like you said, it's, you know, it's often not like a big thing. It's often a little thing, and it's often just that kind of, you know, it's that moment of pure connection that does kind of speak to them in that way. And I think nature, you know, offers um, multiple ways that it appeals to our senses. And I think for all of us, there's, you know, there's, there's going to be an avenue there. And I think that that's a, a great, you know, way to start to create that environment if a parent's looking to create that environment is like how can you do that within you know, as you said a walk every day you know for the next hour look at, at how that is reflecting in the child and it's like and if that can you know give them that hour of you know calmness or that uh, you know alertness by the wind or the sensations of being out then that's contributing and it's making a difference. And so it, it becomes, as you said, it becomes what do we do each day that contributes to making the day the best it can be. Especially, and I want to make sure that the family's listening, especially if your child has sensory processing disorder. And I can tell you from my own experience with my son, 
he has sensory processing disorder and it was hard in the beginning just to kind of go for a walk because all the sounds were just so intense for him and the wind was very intense on his face but little by little um, and as he understood it and even though he didn't have a lot of language especially when we first started um, he now he's doing much better but you know, just to be able to have him experience that and me explain to him in a very calm way, you know, sweetheart, that's the wind. That's the wind blowing on your face. Or, wow, you know, that's what that tree looks like. Or that's what that sound is when you're hearing the dog bark. And just to be able to kind of be in that atmosphere, it seems as though our kids are struggling not understanding the sounds they're hearing or the sensations they're feeling. But I feel like, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like just the more practice and the more exposure that they get to the world, um, it, it seems as though then they understand it better and it's not so fearful of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that was really nicely put how you shared that. Yeah, so I just, for those listening that might feel a little bit intimidated at first, it's definitely something to look into. Now, can you tell us more about the role of botanical medicine um, and how that plays in children with autism? All right, well, we've kind of been talking about that for a bit now. I'm just going to summarize a couple of things about that um, because like, I think we've talked about the role that botanical medicine could play mm-hmm. in, at, as adaptogens. We also talked about the fact that they you know, ha- offer um, support through detoxification. We talked about that botanical medicine offers you know, support for microbiome and gastrointestinal digestive support. Um, and we briefly talked about um, the use of nervines or relaxant agents, uh, which help to impact um, the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. And a lot of times you were mentioning about that sensory. Um, and so when we're talking about herbs here, herbs that are restoring that really help with hypersensitive aspects um, play a part, and those would be our, what we call our nervines or tonics, and, um, and particularly things like uh, go to cola comes to mind for me here, as well, well as wild oats, as, as well as something called American skullcap, and American skullcap has traditionally been a plant that's been used for, you know, nervous fear, uh, you know, nervous irritability within the nervous system, so that agitation of the skin and and agitation of the reflexes and, and um, you know, the hypersensitive to touch and highly sensitive overall. And so there are plants that can help to turn those throttles down a little bit for um, people uh, in that sense and just help to um, kind of buffer it a little bit so that it makes it a little bit easier to, you know, deal with those sensitivities. Now, how do we know when we're looking at herbs, you know, how do we know they're safe? Like, what are the things we should be considering when we're, we're looking at them? Because there's many on the market. There are many. I think that um, you know, asking questions, you know, one is, is that there are good manufacturing processes that herbal manufacturers are supposed to, to uh, follow. <laughs> and that, you know, starts with uh, identifying the material and making sure the raw material is the plant that it should be. And I think... You know, as we look at um, herbs that have been used for a long time in tradition, and we follow up with current science, we begin to see more and more science helping to back the safety of particular plants. We also, you know, as I said, have good manufacturing practices so that <clears throat> by following through, I think making sure that, you, that uh, you know, one reads the label, one, you know, ask questions to make sure that there's no residuals, if you can get organically grown herbs. There are some companies that, you know, will grow from seed to shelf, and they have a lot more um, control over the forms of growing, you know, what kinds of substances are used in preparation. I also think that there are, you know, the American Botanical Society, the American Herbalist Guild, there are more and more organizations that help to give information um, for people to find herbal information as well as reputable companies, uh, you know, who make products. Also, there are are companies that are are making products for children and I think, you know, using um, 
products that are pre-made for children uh, help with compliancy, dosing, safety, and making sure that the formulas are compliable with um, safety for children. And you did talk about several different herbs. Um, you know, for the listeners out there that this is very new to them, um, are there any top, maybe one or two, that you feel would be very good for the listeners to maybe exper- experiment with? Yes, I would say, you know, think about um, lemon balm uh, and, or wild oats. That those would be two plants to think about. And ashwagandha, which is... Um, some people know it as withania, but ashwagandha would be an adaptogen plant to consider as well. Wonderful. Now, how do people find out more about you? Um, are you do you have a website, or um, how do people that maybe you want, want to learn more about your work um, can, I guess, find, find out more about you? Yes, they can go to the Gaia Herb uh, website, and you'll find my uh, bio there. You'll find a connection to me there. Uh, also. Um, I did write a book on uh, natural therapies for infants and children, and I do discuss different aspects of uh, uh, health challenges for children in that. Um, and um, that's also a, uh, a great reference. So, yeah, so those would be, be different ways you could hear what I had to say. Wonderful. So Gaia Herbs, for those listening, is G A I A. H E R B S dot com. And do you have any final messages that you want to leave parents with today? I'm very grateful to have been able to uh, share what uh, I've learned through my experience. And um, I would also say that, um, you know, um, as I said, things happen in little packages, and nature, as well as herbal medicine, uh, have you know, things to offer and finding those options and talking about those options and sharing them is part of how we're able to um, get this information to parents. So please talk about it. Wonderful. I think it's such a wonderful thing to to learn about, and it's so nice to know that there's so many different things to choose from, you know, especially as parents out there, um, when you're looking at a menu of selection, you know, and it's nice that we can kind of turn to nature and and turn to natural products before automatically turning to medicine, which, you know, medications, I should say. Um, There's so much that, you know, Mother Nature has already provided for us. So thank you so, so much for taking the time in your busy schedule to, to help our families today. Well, and thank you, and thank you for your great work as well. Thanks.